Well, thank you for coming. Welcome. This is uh, the C++ track, and uh, they keep moving us, right? If you were at uh, NDC for a few years, you know they keep moving us from room to room. This time they hid us in this very uh, secure enclosure. Uh, but anyway, thank you for coming. And uh, this is going to be investigating C++ applications in production on Linux and Windows, quite a title. Uh, my name is Sasha. I work for a training and consulting company called Sela. Uh, we do uh, this sort of thing, uh, debugging, performance investigations, and uh, specifically if you have C++ uh, that's cross-platform that you try to run on both Windows and Linux or some other flavors of Unix systems, or even if you only target one platform, the whole story of how to look at your application in production, get performance information from production, get uh, diagnostic information from production, has traditionally been uh, pretty difficult, this whole production side of things. So there's lots Lots of tools for the development story, for the development time, profiling and debugging and that sort of thing. Uh, if you're on Windows, I bet you're using uh, Visual Studio or something like this. If you're uh, developing for Linux uh, with C++, you might be using Eclipse. But these development tools, they have uh, some pretty good debugging and uh, occasionally performance profiling capabilities also. Uh, but the production side has often been neglected. And so this is what I want to focus on uh, in this talk, give you uh, some idea of the tools I use and other people use to diagnose issues in production in uh, our C++ applications. Um, so just the slide is not advancing. There we go. Uh, some objectives I would like us to cover uh, and for you to come back at the end of the talk and be sure that you actually learned. Uh, so we'll talk briefly about dump analysis, uh, getting core dumps or dump files, depends on the OS, uh, and analyzing them in a debugger without leaving the production environment, ideally. Uh, we'll talk about some tracing tools, uh, sort of lightweight loggers that you can attach to your application and get an idea of uh, interesting runtime events that are happening, like uh, file accesses, uh, disk accesses, network events, that sort of thing. We'll talk about CPU profiling and how to visualize uh, CPU profiling results to pinpoint uh, CPU bottlenecks in your production system uh, without having to suspend the process, without having to restart the process, just doing this for a live uh, production process. We'll talk about uh, memory leaks briefly and how to identify which areas in your code are allocating and not freeing certain uh, memory blocks. And uh, we'll do that by instrumenting memory allocations, but again, doing this for a live production process without having to recompile or restart it. And finally, we'll talk about some, I'll show you some examples of uh, uh, little one-liner investigations where you briefly, slightly customize a tool uh, to do something very specific. So that's the plan. Uh, in terms of operating systems, so I tried to highlight uh, five core areas which we'll be looking at. Uh, CPU sampling, so figure out the CPU bottleneck. Dynamic tracing, which basically means attaching to an area of the system that is not uh, instrumented with some logging in advance. Then there's static tracing, which is attaching and tracing events on a system which is instrumented for that in advance. And then we have core dump generation and core dump analysis. And for all these different scenarios, I've tried to put together some tools on different operating systems which would be able to uh, sort of stand up to the task and that can be used in a production environment. So for example, when on Windows I'm putting down Visual Studio in there, I do, sh I do intend to show an alternative that you can use if you can't install Visual Studio in your production environment. And uh, on Linux, again, I want to show tools that can actually be used in production. And so what we'll be focusing on is just Windows and Linux, but of course uh, similar options exist uh, for other OSs. Sometimes uh, some features might not be fully supported or exactly the same, but the general idea hopefully will be useful. Before we get started, uh, just a few disclaimers. Uh, first, mind the overhead. Any kind of production investigation comes with the risk of uh, screwing something up in your, uh, in your environment by either slowing things down or uh, even crashing your process because you attach a tool that is too invasive, or maybe even crashing the whole system if you put too much uh, uh, stress on the whole box. So you need to measure, you need to test uh, all the tools I'm going to show you in your own system, in your own test environment, uh, before you go ahead and deploy them to production. And a lot of tools will have a dedicated overhead section in their documentation, at least the good tools. They will tell you what to expect, how they work, and what the expected overhead should be. And then you should be able to decide for yourself. So like if the overhead, uh, the worst case overhead is 20%, is 
I might be okay with this for my production box. Someone else might say, no, anything that's worse than 2%, I cannot afford to run on my production box. But some tools actually have an overhead of like 200%, and then, well, they're just not so well suited for production use, I suppose. So we'll start with uh, core dumps, uh, or dump files, depends on the OS. Just as a very, very general uh, introduction, core dumps, or a dump file, is a memory snapshot of a running process. So you have a process running uh, over time, it has a bunch of threads, and you can attach to the process in a particular moment in time, suspend the process, and write out the process memory to a file. And this can happen either on demand, like whenever you want. So like in this illustration, the process is running, and then we stop it, grab a dump, and let the process continue execution. Or this could happen on crash. So if the process crashes, if the system uh, crashes, it has an unhandled exception or signal, then we can generate a core dump uh, as well. And this is what most people actually recognize when you mention core dumps to them. They think of crash dumps, actually. Uh, but you can generate dumps whenever you want based on arbitrary triggers and conditions. So let's take a look at some of the tools we have for uh, generating dumps. By the way, in terms of demos, I do have uh, live demos of everything, but if something doesn't work or if we don't have time, I also have screenshots. So the slides you will have at the end uh, will hopefully let you reconstruct this whole story uh, on your own box. Uh, so on Linux, the dump generation story is fairly simple. Uh, the system is typically configured in such a way that dumps can be generated when an application crashes. You can get core dumps when an application crashes. There's a magic file called Proxys kernel core pattern, uh, which you can configure for one of two things. You can either put a file name in there, and then you would just get a core dump file with that name in the current directory if your application crashes with some unhandled exception. Or you could put an application name in there and essentially pipe uh, the dump information into a uh, separate process, which might just capture some basic info and write out a log and not actually generate the whole core dump, which could be multiple gigabytes of, of space. So you could uh, pipe the dump output to an application or you write it out uh, to a file. There's also a uh, configuration switch which controls the maximum core dump file size that you are willing to accept and you limit can configure that. And finally, to open core dumps, you can use uh, a bunch of different debuggers, GDB works, LLDB works, and there's uh, obviously additional custom tools as well. The Windows story is fairly similar. On Windows, there's a registry key, of course, because that's the Windows configuration database. So there's a, a registry key that you can configure uh, to get dump files automatically whenever an application crashes. You can configure this uh, to be system-wide or for just one particular process. And both of these things, hopefully, are something that you can actually do on production boxes. On uh, Linux, you might want to limit the core dump file size. On Windows, you have control over the type of the dump, if it's going to contain the whole process memory or just certain portions so that the file is actually smaller. But generally, these settings are something you can apply to a production system, and they would only have effect if a process actually crashes. So as long as you don't have crashes and operation is normal, you don't really pay anything for these uh, settings. You only pay for them when there's an actual crash and you want to identify what happened uh, later. On Windows, there's also proc dump, which can generate core dumps on demand. On Linux, there's a similar tool called gcore, which can generate core dumps on demand. What do you do with them? And I'll show you a quick demo uh, in a moment. So on Linux, uh, you can attach GDB, for example, or LLDB, or a bunch of other debuggers uh, to the dump file, to the core dump, and ask uh, the debugger to give you information about the uh, crash that occurred, the call stack of the current thread, get the list of threads, basically navigate the core dump as if you were attached to the live process at the moment of the crash. This is kind of the idea of generating core dumps. You get a snapshot of the process, and you can uh, just traverse it as if it were live. Of course, you can't continue execution from that point because it's just a snapshot in time, but it does give you the same as if you broke into a debugger and started looking around. That's the effect we want to get. On Windows, uh, Visual Studio can actually open dump files, and this is, again, less interesting for production, 
although you could, of course, copy the file from the production environment to a development box and then open the dump in Visual Studio on your development machine. Alternatively, there is a set of lightweight debuggers, such as WinDBG and CDB, which you can run in the actual production system. It's just files you need to copy over. There's no installation involved. And they can also perform some basic uh, dump analysis and tell you what the exception was, what the call stack was, which modules were loaded, which threads were running, and that sort of thing. And for both of these options, you might also want to look, and that's something I'm not going to cover here, into automation of this whole process. So if you have 100 dump files, opening each of them individually and then running commands manually and inspecting the results is going to get pretty tedious. So you do want to have some sort of script which would uh, get you just the basic, detailed, uh, the basic details out of each uh, core dump, like the crash that occurred, the call stack, which module was responsible, and then the next file and the next and the next. This can be achieved on both Linux and Windows by just automating the debugger, essentially scripting the debugger to do what you want. So I want to show you a couple of examples. Again, uh, I have scr screenshots as a backup, but let's hope we don't need them. Um, so on Windows, I have in my registry the configuration mentioned on the slides. So I have this app called Battery Meter, which crashes occasionally. And uh, I have configured local dumps on my uh, Windows registry to uh, generate dumps for the battery meter process and place them in this folder, c slash temp slash dumps, whenever a crash in that process occurs. Now, if we actually run this crashing battery meter application, here's what it looks like. It's not actually doing anything. It's just a sample, of course. And then I can click around, and still nothing happens. But after a while, it uh, crashes. So application has stopped working, and I can close it. And then if I look in my uh, dumps directory, then there is a sample file I generated yesterday, and there's also the dump file from right now, which Windows created as soon as that process crashed. Now, this is a complete memory snapshot, so we see it's, it's like 64 uh, megabytes, and obviously for larger processes, it could be a lot larger, so there is control you can exercise over the exact size of the file. Now, you can open those, again, like I've said, in Visual Studio, or in uh, a more production-friendly debugger. Just to illustrate what happens when you open this kind of file in Visual Studio, I'm going to drag it in. And then Visual Studio shows me uh, the basic information about the file, which includes uh, the exception code that happened. Now, this number might not tell me much, but if I click Debug here on the right, then Visual Studio displays uh, additional information that says a heap has been corrupted. So I have a memory corruption in this uh, process, actually. And uh, if I click Break, it will show me the call stack where this crash occurred. Uh, so this is a call stack inside the Windows Heap Manager, which uh, had a, uh, a crash. So I basically was trying to free memory, and then the heap noticed that it is corrupted. And I can navigate to my own source code as well, which is in this function here. And then I just need to tell my debugger where to find uh, the source for this, um, for this process. Oh, I don't have the sources here. Well, I'm sorry about that. But you could, um, you could obviously tell your debugger uh, to open the source and actually show you the source. I do have a screenshot of this right over here. This is what it looks like where I do have the sources on the system. It just points to the specific line of source which had the crash. And if you look at the line, it's actually pointing to the closing brace over here. And so you might ask, how come the closing brace is trying to deallocate memory? But then you think about it, and the closing brace is where destructors run, correct? So some destructor was running at this closing brace and trying to uh, free memory. So probably either the battery information or the CPU information classes they have inside a heap pointer, and the destructor for these classes is then trying to free that pointer, and uh, it, it notices that the heap has been corrupted. Now, obviously, this isn't enough to actually investigate what happened exactly, but we know where the crash was and what the exception was and what the call stack was and what all the other threads were doing as well if we wanted to. The same thing we could replicate using uh, either WinDBG or even li more lightweight debuggers. Uh, 
Again, these are, there are many options, and we're not going to look in depth at all of them. But for example, in WinDBG, which is a lightweight debugger, you could drag and drop the dump file into the debugger again. And then if you run an uh, extra command called heap, you would actually get uh, some more specific information about the heap corruption. And this is something Visual Studio actually doesn't do. And so this uh, more specific information would tell you, for example, that we detected an error whose features are consistent with a buffer overrun. So our memory corruption in the heap is not just a random memory corruption. It looks like a buffer overrun of a heap buffer, which can be used for further investigation. And this whole process can also be automated. So here I have a screenshot from a command line window on, uh, on Windows where I ran the CDB exe uh, tool. This is a command line debugger, which is, again, very, very lightweight. And what it can give you is uh, the same analysis, essentially, in, in, uh, in the shape of a text file. And I have actually stored uh, that text file right over here, so we can look at it if we want. And um, this is just an analysis, an exception analysis, which has in, in text format the same information. We had a corrupted heap. You can see the call stack. You can see the function in which it happened. The reason I'm showing this is just to explain that we can automate the whole process. Once I have a command, a one-liner, that analyzes the dump and generates this kind of text, I can build a whole workflow which would do this for 100 files and then aggregate the, the exception results. Let's take a look at the story on Linux just very briefly. So uh, this is a screenshot, but let's uh, try and do it live. Um, so I have over here uh, a core file which was generated previously from uh, crashing one of my uh, sample processes. These are all online, so you could uh, replicate these results later. So I'm going to uh, just resize this a little. I'm going to run uh, GDB and uh, tell GDB that the actual application we are, um, we are looking at is, uh, sorry, it's over here in this folder, actually. It's called pargrep, and the core file is this core file over here. And then GDB happily loads that core file and says that uh, the program was terminated with the signal SIG abort. Uh, so this is why we crashed. And it tells me that the current thread is thread number one. And then we, get, we could again perform some analysis. So for example, I could get a stack trace in, uh, in GDB. And this is C++. So the function names, you know what, it, what it's like. Uh, the function names are slightly on, on the longer side. Um, <clears throat> but you can see that um, this whole thing is happening inside the heap. So this also has a heap corruption, very likely. Uh, so we are trying to call uh, libc free to free memory. And then it just uh, bails out with, a, with an error. And we can see along the way some strings indicating double free or corruption. So we, ha we also have a heap corruption here. And if we look uh, at the whole call stack, which is kind of um, uh, hard to read through, but if we look at the call stack, it, it, we, we got here from, uh, from std vector um, over here, std vector of string, which was trying to uh, allocate something. So it called into the allocator and probably had to resize things. And, and eventually, the, the uh, heap uh, implementation again in libc noticed that the heap has become corrupted. Um, so this is just, again, a very, very general overview of what dump files and core dumps can do for you. Um, you can generate them automatically when something goes wrong. You can then, on the same system, even in production, analyze the crash and see like what's, what's happening in your process. And this is very, very similar across uh, operating systems. And it is a key way of diagnosing production crashes, essentially. There's, uh, I mean, hardly uh, a way to run a debugger attached to your production process at all times. So this is the second best thing. It basically replicates the whole debugger experience on a, on a snapshot of your uh, process's memory. Now, it unfortunately requires, if you are trying to do this on the production system, it unfortunately requires that you have debug information or debugging symbols on the production system as well. If you want to do core dump analysis in production, you will also need debug information in production. If you do not have debug information, and I'll touch on that in a second, you will get uh, meaningless call stacks. You will not get function names. You will not get code uh, addresses and source information. So for example, on Linux, you might get something like this, where the call stack is just full of question marks. 
On Windows, you might get a call stack, which maybe looks a little better, but it doesn't actually have function names, uh, mostly, right? It only has uh, module names and offsets. So this is typically happening because you don't have debug information or symbols for your, uh, for your application. And just to briefly cover that before we move on, um, on Linux, when you build, you need to generate debug information into, into your binary. This is something that happens at link time. And that debug information would include function names, class names, layouts of various types, parameter information, source information as well. And if you don't like the fact it bloats up your binaries, then you can separate the debug information from the actual executable or from your actual library. So you can emit it into the binary, but then separate them so you have a, a separate debug information file and a separate uh, executable file. And on Windows, it's a pretty similar story, except they are always separate. So on Windows, when you compile with debug information, the compiler and linker generate a separate file called PDB, a PDB file, which contains uh, the debug information. And if you're looking for uh, debug information for binaries outside of your control, like your uh, C++ uh, runtime implementation or your C++ library, then these should probably be available uh, well, officially, so you're not, you're, you don't really have to build these components from source in order to get debug information for them. Uh, on Windows, Microsoft makes available most of the debug information for Microsoft binaries, so for the STL and the C++ runtime and so on, Microsoft has a public server, a web server, which will serve your debugger the debug info files automatically. And on Linux, it's slightly more evolved, but still most distributions would have ready-made packages with debug information that you can install. So for example, on Ubuntu, you might be able to install um, a package with the dbg suffix, whereas on Fedora, for example, there is a dedicated debug info install command, which takes a package and tries to find the matching debug information. Of course, there's a lot of subtleties here in terms of finding the exact right version and so on, but this is something that generally debuggers have learned to take care of uh, for us. So this was the dump analysis story in very, very short, and I hope uh, I sort of try, uh, managed to convey the important pieces of this, of, of, of being able to, get, to gather dump files when something crashes or goes wrong in your production environment, and then analyzing those crash dumps or core dumps even on the same system. The reason I am doing this, this sort of summary is that from now on we're going to move to uh, pr performance and tracing things. And if you have any questions about the diagnostic part we saw so far, uh, you could, uh, we could talk about this at the end. So we're going to talk about, again, performance and tracing now, again, on both operating systems. And there's a, an important concept to get out of the way first, which is the concept of sampling versus tracing. So essentially, uh, both of these are just techniques for diagnostics, for getting performance information and diagnostic information out of the system. Sampling works by not looking at everything that is happening, but rather grabbing samples once in a while. So for example, if you wanted to follow a CPU execution of a particular application, you probably couldn't record every single CPU instruction as it is executed. That would be a little too expensive. So you usually use sampling for this. You configure the CPU to give you, for example, an interrupt every million instructions executed, and then you aggregate those samples. So you don't really have a record of every single instruction. You have a record every millionth instruction, but then you aggregate those samples, and you have something statistically meaningful uh, to draw results from. Uh, tracing, on the other hand, is recording every single event. And this is something you typically use uh, for lower frequency things, like uh, disk accesses, maybe uh, DNS resolution requests, HTTP requests, that sort of thing, which is only happening like uh, 10,000 times per second and not 10 billion times per second. So that's pretty much where uh, sampling and tracing would fit in and at these uh, request rates, essentially. So on Windows, uh, both sampling and tracing are pretty well covered by a mechanism called event tracing for Windows. In the previous slot, there was actually a talk uh, about ETW uh, with a more .NET perspective, but it can absolutely be used for C++ on Windows as well. And I'll show you some pretty cool things that we can do with ETW. Uh, 
It is basically a logging infrastructure for the operating system where various components across the system, like uh, the kernel itself, the scheduler, the memory manager, the heap implementation, a bunch of other components, emit interesting trace messages that we can either record into a file or analyze in real time. Just get the events in real time and process them without even saving them to disk. And this allows for very low overhead uh, tracing tools to be implemented. If you don't actually store the events, if you just look at them in real time and then drop them, you can get very low overheads, even if you have high frequencies of events. Like memory allocations, for example, could be happening uh, hundreds of thousands of times per second, but you could still feasibly use ETW if you are discarding events and not actually recording the whole thing. On Linux, there is a similar mechanism, similar in spirit anyway, uh, called perf events, which is built into the Linux kernel. It's been available for ages as well, and it can do sampling and tracing uh, again. It has a very similar architecture, actually, where there's various kinds of events that you can enable, and they can either go into a file for later analysis or into a shared memory buffer for real-time consumption by some kind of application. And Linux also has a front end for using perf events, which is just called perf. And it's not built into Linux in the sense it won't always be available by default, but it is part of the Linux kernel tree, so you can install it typically or even build it from source uh, for the specific kernel that you have. And it works on a variety of platforms, uh, Intel obviously, but also ARM and a bunch of other uh, less traditional uh, platforms that Linux works on. And before we actually look at uh, collecting, storing, and, and well, visualizing uh, events from sampling and tracing, I do want to mention just briefly uh, something a lot of C++ developers are already using, but some are not, uh, which is a visualization method for a lot of performance information that we'll be generating today, very, very useful and important, called flame graphs. It is basically a way to visualize lots of stack traces. So for example, Suppose you record all the file accesses that your system is performing, and you have a call stack of where that file access came from in your code. And then you want to see like which paths in my code are causing lots of file accesses. You might want to do the same thing with network events, which paths in my code are causing lots of network accesses, or which parts in my code are using lots of CPU time. So whenever you have a lot of call stacks, and you want to visualize them quickly in a meaningful way, this is where uh, flame graphs come in. And uh, we'll, I'll show you an example in a moment, but basically, if you look at the diagram, it is just an adjacency diagram where uh, there's two axes. The, the horizontal axis is not a timeline. It is just sorted alphabetically. So it's not a timeline series. It's just a sorted alphabetically uh, chart. The, the vertical axis, the y-axis, is a call stack. So if you see a function on top of another function, it means it was called by that other function. And of course, I didn't say, but every rectangle in the graph is uh, a function, is a function in a call stack that you collected. And the wider something is, the more prominent it was. So width is something that's fairly easy to identify, and this is why flame graphs are useful. You can glance at the whole thing immediately, and you can say, okay, so this thing here on the right looks interesting, let's look at that, but this little flame over here, right, this thing, it doesn't look meaningful. So even though I can't see the function name, I'm probably not gonna zoom into that unless I'm really desperate, because uh, that's, that's just a tiny proportion of time. So let's see how to generate those, just one little thing before we get there. Uh, in order to actually successfully resolve call stacks, so we get a full picture of where the event was coming from, we have to overcome uh, a pretty annoying optimization, which some compilers uh, do uh, by default, called frame pointer emission. Uh, basically, frame pointer emission means that the compiler will not, will not create uh, a linked list of frame pointers on the stack. So you can't reconstruct the stack by just looking at its state in a given time. And that can make it hard for tools like ETW and perf and other profiling tools as well to get an accurate stack trace of your threads. Now, FPO does have like some performance benefit. 
but I think it is mostly agreed by people in the performance world that it's not worth it. Like the, the, the two or three percent performance benefit you get from this optimization is not worth the pain in profiling and debugging your system later. So essentially, it's, it's an optimization worth turning off. Now, on Linux, um, there's a switch for uh, most compilers called fno omit frame pointer, which will disable this optimization. Um, Linux actually, in some cases, if you have full debug information, uh, perf would sometimes be able to figure out your call stack even if you do have FPO turned on, but a lot of other tools will not be able to cope with it, so you, you probably would want to turn this off anyway. And on Windows, uh, ETW basically doesn't work if you have a binary compiled with this optimization. So uh, the Microsoft compilers anyway, they stopped using this optimization for quite a while. I think since Visual C++ 2003, uh, they realized it's just not worth the, the pain in debugging and profiling, which usually results. So once we have that out of the way, we can actually take a look at getting some stack traces out of a live running system. We'll start with CPU profiling, but then I'll talk about off CPU time as well, so blocked threads, like why is my thread blocking and waiting for something, and then we'll talk about memory leaks as well, which are, uh, well, the technique I'm gonna use is still going to be based on collecting stack traces at interesting points. So let's uh, take a look, a quick look at the CPU story first. Uh, I might skip by using screenshots here, but I do wanna show the, the um, target application that I'll be using. It is a very simple one on Windows called Stupid Notepad. Um, it's a Notepad-like uh, app. This is a Notepad-like app. And I am typing uh, like pretty fast, but there are some delays. So there are these hiccups in the, um, in the app. And uh, if I put it side by side with uh, something simple like Task Manager and uh, just look at Stupid Notepad at the CPU usage, so if you look at that uh, at the same time as I'm typing, uh, you would see occasional uh, jumps, right? So it goes from zero all the way to 20, 18, something like that. So there are CPU spikes. And uh, I mean, even without using any professional tools, you might be able to conclude that the CPU spikes are related to my typing activity. And when there is a spike, then there is also a lag in the uh, actual user interface. So this is what we want to investigate. And on Windows, we are going to use ETW for this. We're going to record events every certain number of clock cycles. We're going to record the call stack of what this application is doing, and then we'll visualize the whole thing. So the recording, if I actually did it from scratch here, I would probably do with Windows Performance Recorder, which is a free tool based on ETW, which you can absolutely put in production. And in its, uh, in its basic mode, it just has a bunch of checkboxes you can check for recording different kinds of interesting events. So you want uh, to profile just CPU usage, well, check the CPU usage uh, checkbox. And then you do a recording with this tool, and you open it with a slightly different tool called, oops, the Windows Performance Analyzer. So this is uh, uh, the, the, the matching tool. They both ship as part of the same uh, library, and you can actually just copy them over. It's just uh, executable files. You, did, you don't really need to install anything. Now, once I opened my uh, recording file in Windows Performance Analyzer, it can give me an overview. First, let's just switch back to the line graph. It can give me an overview of CPU usage across the different processes on my system. And uh, this is just a default view. There's a bunch of options we could customize. But you can see that uh, the stupid notepad process, which is this guy over here, this is this line, um, has pretty obvious spikes in CPU activity. And I can actually filter and just keep that one process on my chart. Uh, so you can see these pretty obvious spikes in activity over the recording interval. So most of the time I'm idle, but then I just have those spikes going all the way up to 25% uh, of, of CPU. And actually, it's across all cores. So if I have four cores, 25% is one full core being utilized by this process. Now, I want to figure out w which parts of the actual code are, sp um, are being spent um, on CPU. And this is where uh, the stack view comes in. So let me just see if I can, yeah, 
So I'm going to start expanding here, and one of the things I want you to see is that you can, uh, when you visualize a stack tree like this, texturally, like an actual tree, which is the default for a lot of tools, it can be really hard to see what's going on. You'd need to expand lots and lots of levels to figure out which function is actually taking lots of time. And if you've ever used profilers, you know that most profilers will default to this sort of view, which has a tree that you have to navigate up to a 100 depth, which is really hard. So let's start navigating. And just to give you an idea, this is a very simple application, by the way. But it is Windows, and there is a lot of uh, stuff around. So I am still expanding. And none of this is still my actual code. Um, so I'm going to keep expanding a little more. And we are in dispatch message and uh, internal call Wilden procedure. And OK, so this is actually a function in my application that I can tell you something about. If we make it a little bigger, this is a function called onChangeMainEdit, which is in my source code. And it's probably, I mean, judging by the name, it's probably called whenever I type something in. And so it looks like it's doing uh, some CPU work. Now, how much exactly? I could go back here. And so this count column that you see is the number of stack traces that we grabbed, which had this function on the stack. So how, how many samples did we grab overall? We had 8,960 uh, 8, stack samples overall. 5,000 something were in that function and its descendants. So this is probably one of the CPU bottlenecks in my application. But I mean, I did have to navigate the tree quite a bit. And um, it's, it's very painful <laughs> for more complex apps, obviously. So uh, flame graphs, again, could be pretty useful. And Windows Performance Analyzer actually now has support for flame graphs. This is relatively new. So if we switch to the flame graph view, here's what it looks like. And I mean, the individual rectangles are a little too small to read. So we don't really see function names unless we zoom in even further. But hopefully, like the structure of the tree is immediately visible. So I don't really need to navigate through, sorry, I'm not going to point at this screen. I don't really have to navigate through this whole hierarchy to figure out that these are the functions I should be looking at. right? So everything below, I just see it has the same width, and there's nothing particularly interesting in there, probably. So I can immediately go to this onChange main edit function. And then if I want, I could investigate its descendants, like which functions are called by this guy in order to uh, consume CPU time. So again, this is just a visualization technique, but a pretty useful one. And I hope you uh, find it useful as well. Uh, the underlying process was quite simple. We recorded stack samples. And then we used Windows Performance Analyzer to take a look. The Linux story is uh, fairly simple. Let's see if we uh, could do this live. Uh, so let's try the Matt Exp app. So this is a, a very simple uh, C++ app, which uh, basically uh, multiplies uh, matrices uh, 500 times. And uh, it's pretty CPU intensive. And I want to figure out where. So we're going to use, on Linux, we're going to use perf in order to investigate uh, its behavior. So I'm just going to switch over to this root shell, make it a little bigger. And uh, I will run perf. This is the front end for, uh, for the perf events mechanism, which I have installed. I'm going to run it in record mode. I will instruct it to capture 97 uh, samples per second. So this is easily configurable. I will instruct it to grab call stacks for me. The G switch is for call stack for some reason. Well, actually, it's called graph, so maybe it makes sense. And then finally, I need to give it the actual workload to, to execute, or I could attach it to an already running process. I'm going to use a, a, just the existing binary. OK, so it's running with perf attached and uh, taking 97 snapshots per second. And you can see it, it basically finished. And it says, I wrote out 632 samples. So again, 97 times per second. 
perf grabbed a call stack of what the application was doing, and at the end we have 632 of those snapshots. And it's not very big, like the file we, we wrote this to was not very big, just uh, uh, 72 kilobytes or so. Of course, if we increase the frequency, or if you have multiple cores being used, or if you capture for a longer interval, your files might grow uh, bigger. And now it's time to visualize this. So I could show you, we're going to skip that, I could show you the native perf interface for looking at the, recording, uh, at the recorded information. It's basically this uh, command line based uh, UI, it's curses, um, but we're not going to go through that. I just want to immediately generate a flame graph of this and show you the flame graph. So I have a screenshot of the flame graph, which is going to be a little easier. Here's what the flame graph looks like on the bottom. So again, instead of navigating through a lot of, uh, a lot of stack frames, a lot of trees, I can just immediately see that the hottest functions in this app are uh, matrix of float operator. Oh, this is actually unfortunate. This is operator uh, uh, rectangular brackets, but uh, the flame graph generator actually stripped that. It probably thought it was just uh, uh, unnecessary. Well, C++, you know. So this... Um, this is matrix of float operator rectangular brackets, and also matrix of float operator star uh, is doing the actual multiplication. And here on the right, there's also something inside vector. Now, if this, was, uh, if this were a live flame graph, I could actually um, navigate this view and zoom in. Again, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm not going to zoom into this, but I will have the flame graph file for you to look at if you'd like. So this is, again, just a very quick way uh, from the command line to generate a visualization of where my process is spending time. And what's nice about perf here is that the overhead is totally controllable. So I used um, 97 uh, snapshots per second here. If this is too much and I see it slows down my process, I can bring this down. I can take 10 samples per second. And if I record for sufficiently long, I will have a meaningful sample. Or on the other hand, if I don't get enough samples, then I could uh, increase the number of samples per second. And from experience, uh, around 100 samples per second works pretty much OK on, on typical systems, unless you have a very large number of cores. And then you'd probably want to take this uh, down a notch, because it grabs a sample of every core. So it will get bigger if you have more cores. So this was uh, just CPU profiling. And I want us to be able to apply a very similar technique for memory leak analysis as well. And now again, if you've been doing C++ for a while, you know that there are some development time tools for this, like uh, Valgrind on, on Linux, and some uh, code analysis tools on Windows as well. These are not very uh, relevant for production use, because they typically either slow down your process uh, like by 500%, or they require recompilation, which is not something you'd probably do in production. So instead, here's a general process we're going to follow. Uh, we are going to attach to a running process and look at every malloc and free call. And of course, if you're using some custom allocator, we could attach to your custom allocator's allocation routine and your custom allocator's deallocation routine. And then for each allocation you make, we're going to record and store the allocated address and the size and the call stack which led to that allocation. And then whenever you free memory, we'll look at the address, and if it's something we know that you allocated before, we're just going to discard that allocation. So at any given time, we only have the outstanding allocations, the one that were allocated but not freed yet by the application. When we suspect that there's a memory leak, we can just dump out all the outstanding allocations and see how many bytes we have outstanding, how many allocations we have outstanding, and which call stacks led to those outstanding allocations. So which call stacks allocated memory that wasn't freed yet. Now, of course, it will still be up to you to determine if it's a, if it's a genuine leak or just something you're going to free later, right? But it will still give you the immediate insight into, OK, so here's something I have allocated and haven't freed yet. Does that make sense? Now, of course, aggregation is very important here, because if I have a million outstanding allocations, I don't want to see a million lines. I want something aggregated. So this call stack 
performed 100,000 allocations that were not freed yet. Now, the old way of doing this on Linux, and I'm going to show the, the Linux and Windows ways in a moment, the old way of doing this on Linux would be by using uh, perf again. We could instruct perf to record malloc and free calls in the libc library, put that in a file, in a perf.data file, and then analyze it using some kind of script, I suppose, uh, to see which allocations were outstanding. Now, this is um, slow, probably, and the perf.data file that we generate is probably going to be uh, gigantic. If we do this for even five minutes on a typical process, it's going to be a huge uh, data file. So the new way, and this is something worth knowing about modern Linux systems, the new way is to actually do the whole aggregation part, the stack aggregation part, in the kernel when you uh, attach to the interesting events, rather than dump out the whole thing to a file and then look at the file contents later. So there's a unique kernel technology on Linux. There's not something like this available for Windows, unfortunately, called BPF. And this, is, uh, this has been part of Linux uh, since Linux, uh, well, uh, the, the original BPF technology actually has been part of Linux for ages. Uh, but using BPF for tracing is something you can do since Linux 4.1 or so. So it's, it's fairly recent, and it's only in fairly recent kernels. However, if you do have a sufficiently recent kernel, you can get the next generation of tracing tools, essentially, by using that kernel side aggregator rather than dumping all the events out to a file and then analyzing the file. And there's a large collection of tools called BCC, which you can find online. Uh, I've also written some of those, and there's contributors from a bunch of different companies, all open source tools which uh, use the BPF technology in order to solve particular problems which are too expensive for uh, standard tracers. Here are some of the tools uh, that BCC contains, and one of them happens to be uh, Memleak up top, which is a tool for uh, inspecting memory leaks. It basically does what I described previously. It attaches to malloc and free, and then it dumps out a record of outstanding allocations. But it doesn't dump every single event to a file and post-process it later. It does the aggregation on the kernel side of things. So the only thing that's actually stored in memory is this call stack made 100 allocations. You don't even store the same call stack 100 times. You do the aggregation right when you collect uh, the event. So the overhead is much, much lower. In practical terms, what does it look like? So uh, I'm going to switch to screenshots here because we don't have a lot of time. On the Windows side of things, and I'm going to start in the same order, on the Windows side of things, if you have a, a memory leak like this, we're going to use exactly the strategy I just described. We're going to attach to malloc and free, and we're going to inspect uh, the differences, the outstanding allocations. And the way we actually attach to malloc and free is going to be using etw events. This is a full listing of all the commands you would need to run for this in order to attach uh, etw tracing to heap allocations and frees and get a file that has a record of every allocation and free that your process has made. But again, it's going to be a file, so it's going to be a pretty massive file. And you would need to analyze that file later because Windows doesn't have BPF or anything like it. So this is actually the only way to get uh, this sort of thing. And then you would analyze that recording in Windows Performance Analyzer or some other ETW tool. And again, just skipping to the, uh, to the crux of it, you would be able to get a stack trace which allocates memory that wasn't freed. So this is all outstanding allocations. And you'd be able to see the number of the allocations made by that call stack and their total impacting size. So the total size of those allocations in bytes. So this is a call stack inside my application which has allocated eight megabytes of memory which hasn't been freed yet. So this is what we get from this uh, uh, output. And again, it's, it's actually pretty simple. Like the whole process, you can write a batch file which would do this for you, but it does rely on generating a huge file. If you run this on a production system for 10 minutes, you could get uh, like several gigabytes worth of allocation and free uh, data. 
The Linux side is slightly easier, so I'm just going to skip over to the actual tool. This is output from the memleak tool from BCC, and it basically dumps out stack traces and how many outstanding allocations these stack traces have. So it's basically the same information except in text format, and it can be parsed and displayed as a flame graph if you prefer. So again, it's just stack traces, so it might actually make sense to display them as a flame graph. And so, as usual, there's this uh, huge uh, C++ stack here, so it's a little hard to read, but it does say at the beginning, I have uh, 95 outstanding allocations, which are responsible for slightly under a megabyte of memory, which all came from this call stack. So this call stack has made 95 allocations which have not been reclaimed, which have not been freed. And you can go ahead and analyze and, if, and see if that makes sense, um, that your app should not have freed that memory yet. So I'm going to cover very briefly, just to leave a minute or two for questions as well, uh, I'm going to cover very briefly two additional scenarios which tracing tools can cover in a very similar way. So there's not going to be something super innovative here, but just to let you know that these scenarios can also be covered on both operating systems using pretty much the same tools we already learned about. So one of those is blocked time. A lot of applications don't actually have lots of CPU usage or not exclusively about CPU usage. They actually have a lot of blocking as well. So waiting for something, waiting for a synchronization mechanism, waiting for network, waiting for a database, waiting for a file. These are waiting things that our applications would typically do. Now to trace that time, to actually account for that time where our processes are uh, sleeping, essentially waiting for something, we can use context switch events from the operating system. So both on Windows and on Linux, we can ask the respective tracing tools to get us a record of every context switch. So whenever a thread switches from running to waiting, and then back from waiting to running, we can trace where this is happening, when this is happening, for how long this is happening, and then give you a picture of, okay, so this function here, I spent five seconds waiting for a lock while in that function. So it's essentially just a matter of correlating the context switch events, which of course sounds easier than it is, but someone has already done this job. But basically, we just need from the OS the context switch information in order to do that. Now, the only reason I'm even mentioning this is that context switches are a pretty common thing. So you could have a million context switches per second, like easily, on a typical loaded system. And recording every single context switch to a file, again, is going to be pretty prohibitive. So on Linux, we have BPF, which can do this analysis without actually storing stuff to disk. On Windows, we could potentially process some of this information in real time, but in practice, most tools will record this to a file and then analyze the file. So this is slightly uh, less efficient on Windows. Actually, not slightly. This is less efficient on Windows. Um, so what can this look like? I'm just going to skip straight to the actual screenshots. Uh, or even I have this open on my Windows box. So this is what it can look like on Windows. By aggregating all the context switch events, I could get a timeline view of each of the threads in my process and see exactly what it was doing and when. So for example here, if I focus on my main thread in my application, I can see on a timeline from 0 to 20 seconds exactly by colors and times what that thread was doing. So green here is execution. This is synchronization. I also have some sleeping going on. So I can see exactly what my thread is doing in terms of waiting and running. And if I click any of those, like I did here, I actually get a stack trace. So what the thread was doing. If it was blocked, where was it blocked? If it was running, what was it running? Again, this is all available just by virtue of looking at the context switch events from running to waiting and from waiting back to running. But again, the underlying data can be pretty massive because every context switch would have to be traced. On the Linux side of things, uh, on the Linux side of things, we could use uh, BCC tools based on the BPF kernel technology to get a flame graph of where my threads in my applications are actually uh, sleeping, waiting, blocking for something without having to generate 
a, uh, a file that has an event for every single context switch. So basically what I used here is a tool called off CPU time, which is from the BCC collection on, on GitHub. And it generates a recording, but the recording only contains the aggregated results. So I don't have like every single context switch in there. I only have the aggregated record saying, this call stack had 500,000 context switches, which took that much time. So I don't aggregate every single uh, context switch, making this a tool that you could actually run uh, in production. So that's, uh, that's for context switches. And the last thing I want to briefly mention is tracing file and disk and network I.O., which is very important. And so you might be asking, like, why am I leaving this for the last four and a half minutes of the presentation? But the reason is basically that it's, it's more of the same. We have basically seen the underlying technology for tracing different kinds of events. So here it's just a matter of picking the right events to trace. So on Windows, for example, ETW can trace file accesses and disk accesses and network send and receive events. And on Linux, similar trace points are available in the kernel for block uh, IO access, for network access. So essentially, it's just a matter of using the same tools, ETW on Linux, on Windows, uh, Perf and BCC on Linux, to just get an aggregation of file accesses and uh, network accesses and disk accesses and that sort of thing. Just a few screenshots of what's possible to get your appetite up. Um, for example, on the left, you see a Linux tool which gives you a record of which files are currently the hottest across the systems. Like, which files am I accessing the most for reads and for writes? Kind of like top, but for files, for file accesses. On the right, you see a similar thing from Windows when looking at a recording in Windows Performance Analyzer, you can see a summary of which files are being heavily accessed on this particular system. The only difference is Linux is live, Windows is uh, analyzing a recording, a recording file. That's the only difference between those. Tracing file accesses in real time is also possible. So on the left on Linux, you see a tool which prints out every file access taking longer than a certain time. So slow file accesses, print them, please. And on the left, there is a Windows command line tool, uh, which I wrote, called eTrace, which does uh, pretty much the same thing. You can instruct it to look at ETW events and print out events matching a certain filter. So again, there's some screenshots here of what this whole thing would look like. Just a couple of final notes to see here, which might be interesting for you. This is pretty cool if you have mechanical drives, like non-SSD. Uh, this is basically a summary of where the disk head is on your drive. Um, so again, on SSDs it is slightly less interesting, but on mechanical disks it's pretty important uh, occasionally to optimize and defragment the drive so that you have uh, adjacent accesses happening at the same offset on disk, roughly. So you don't have a lot of travel, a lot of uh, uh, seeks, essentially. And this is a diagram that can show you those. Um, this is a Linux screenshot of a tool called OpenSnoop, which is pretty cool, and it traces uh, failures to open files. So whenever you have a process that tries to open a file and fails, it would print which file it was and what the error was. So just again, some of the things that are possible by uh, instrumenting those same uh, underlying mechanisms, perf on uh, Linux and uh, ETW on Windows. So hopefully we've seen this whirlwind tour of uh, uh, diagnostics and performance investigations on both operating systems. Uh, we, we looked at crash dump analysis and how to get core dumps of uh, crashing processes on both OSs and how to get uh, basic details like a stack trace and exception information out of them. We talked about some of the performance tracing tools that can be used for production with uh, C++ applications. We saw how to generate flame graphs of various things, not just CPU use, which is the most typical use, but also for um, like blocked time, for example, or for disk accesses and that sort of thing. And we looked at memory leak analysis, which is pretty tricky, especially in production, but you see there are some options available for this uh, as well. There are some references in the slides uh, touching on the different tools we looked at today. There's lots and lots to learn, of course, beyond this presentation. And here are the uh, slides and all the demos I've used.
Uh, some of these are actually in lab format. So if you would like to spend a few hours practicing some of these tools, you can look at those two GitHub repos, which have labs for both Linux and Windows that you can try in your own environment and just learn more um, about some of those scenarios I used. But all of these are covered, all my demos are covered by these two uh, repositories. Now we have 22 seconds for questions, which is going to be a little tricky. And also I have uh, in 20 minutes a talk in another room. So if anyone wants to chat, we could do that during lunch, or you could walk with me there. Uh, but this is as much as I can offer, because I do have a talk uh, in 20 minutes. Uh, anyway, thank you very, very much for coming, and I hope you enjoy the rest of NDC. Please be in touch. Thank you. Thank you.